terrific to be back again with our good friend from Sneakers Corner. Uh, this is Dr. Jay Smith, and uh, you've all been follow following what's been happening on the internet uh, with the enormous backlash against these two very well-known Muslim scholars, academics, Dr. Shabir Ali and Yasir Qadi. These two fellows who have come out and has finally admitted that there are changes to the Quran and that this preservation is not something that we have known uh, or where we have not been told at least. Uh, many of us have known this and this is what we've been talking about. Now on these shows we have always wanted to go back to the very time, the very period that Muhammad lived, the very period that supposedly Islam began, the seventh century. And we've been doing that and I, uh, with my good friends Murad and also Mel from Sneakers Corner, and we've always tried to get people focused on the seventh century because so much of everything we know about Islam is from the eighth and ninth century, much, much too late, two to 300 years too late. And one of the things that we have really been putting, pulling out, even before the whole Quran thing exploded all over the internet, uh, before the Qira'at problems exploded all over the internet, was the person of Muhammad. We brought uh, Robert uh, Spencer on board to look at his book, did Muhammad exist to unpack it for all of you? And we brought Mel and Murad, uh, Murad from the Middle East, who speaks fluent Arabic. Mel, who has done all this work on looking and unpacking about the caliphs. Uh, we talked about the Dome of the Rock. That has gone viral. Uh, proving that you're interested in this and proving that we are hitting a nerve on this and proving that we need to continue with this area of the seventh century because it's that person, Muhammad, and that book, the Quran, that we're centering most of our energies on. Now, we've done quite a bit on the Quran. We want to go now back to Muhammad himself. And we want to talk about this man, Muhammad, who the Muslims are totally dependent on because without Muhammad, they don't really have a paradigm. Without Muhammad, they don't have a religion. Without Muhammad, they don't have a model. And so because he is so important to Muslims, well, we've always wondered why is it if he's that important, if he did so many things, if he is the great model for all people everywhere at all times in all places, then why is it that he's not better known? Or even is he at all known? So if he is not known at all in the seventh century, then where are all the, these legends and these traditions and these sayings? What are they hanging on? Who is this person that they're all hanging on? Because the eighth and ninth century do talk about him, especially the ninth and 10th century. They have an awful lot to say about him, but that's two to 300 years old. What is and who is this man that they're placing all their traditions on, all of their, really, everything they know about him? Who is this man, Muhammad? Well, we do know that the name Muhammad is very common. It's a common name. It was a common name back then. So there could be many, many, many Muhammads. But Mel has come up with an interesting theory. And this is a theory. We're not saying that this is the truth yet, because uh, like everything that we're doing, uh, we're, these are what we call white papers. We're just putting them out there for you to hear, for you to listen, and then you start to connect the dots. So I brought Mel on board, and in fact, he's actually traveling, aren't you, Mel? Hi, Mel. Good to have you here. Hi. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the middle of a, a trans-European cycle. So I, um, this is my fifth cycle across Europe, believe it or not, in the last few years. Uh, yeah, something I do. You don't mean motorbike, you mean actually cycling. No, I mean, I mean pedaling, cycling, yeah, yeah. And so you so, go for uh, Europe by yourself, don't you? So you're, where are you right now? I'm actually in uh, the middle of France in Tours. Uh, the famous city which um, the Franks kicked out the um, the Muslims or the Moors, I should say, back in Charles Martel, as I recall, in 730, 32, uh, wasn't that it? Charles Martel in the 8th century pushed out the Moors, pushed out the Muslims. They would have been known as Muslims at, by that time. Yeah and threw them out of right there in the city of Tours. Though you are on tour, you're in the city of Tours. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's only when you're there you realize how far they had got. And if they hadn't won that battle, it would have been a different story. We wouldn't be making this video now. Uh, we would be... all be speaking Arabic, would we not? And we would all be, we would all be yeah. Muslims by this time. And, the, and yeah. the, can you imagine the whole world under the, the control of Islam here in the 21st yeah. century? I shudder to think. So really where you're at is absolutely important for this whole context of what, of, of stopping Islam and making sure it does not take over and control. But back then, back then, we still want to go back even further because we want to go back beyond 732. We want to go back right back to 632, 100 years earlier. So 100 years earlier, 
you think that you may have found who this Muhammad, or at least who this tradition of Muhammad has been placed on. And it's not the yeah. Muhammad that we know. It's not the Muhammad of faith, as the traditions are telling us. It's a complete nick of Muhammad. And you have, yeah. a, you have a PowerPoint that you want to walk us through. Yeah, I'm going to, I'll share it with you now. Okay, while he's bringing up the PowerPoint, can you see why we're doing it? This is absolutely important that somebody does do this, and it's absolutely important that we take this seriously and then see if really much of what Abdul Malik or the others then introduce, and of course, we probably don't even know that he came into being until 7.30, this, the Muhammad you know, we now know. What we are Sorry. Saying, go you ahead. Need to re you need to re-enable me. Apologies. Okay, while I'm doing that, re-enabling, isn't that nice? I have to re-enable people to be able to, be able, even to be able to work alongside me. But this is the one of the exigencies of what we now know as Zoom webinar. But while he's now getting it, sharing the screen, uh, he'll be walking through it. I'm going to give it over to you, Mel, and I'm going to let you do the talking here. Try to convince me, and if you can convince me, then I'm sure you can convince almost everybody else that's watching. Who do you think may be this Muhammad? Over to you. Okay, so um, I suppose as a background to this, I have been looking for any mention of Muhammad in rock inscriptions, and in, there are about 30,000 rock, in, 30, rock inscriptions across Arabia, and not a single one has been found with Muhammad from the 7th century. Um, so it occurred to me that perhaps Muhammad is just a title, and he had a, an original name before that. And this was the name by which he was known at that time, the seventh century. So if we, if we find that name, I think we'll probably unlock an, an awful lot more about the historical Muhammad and who he was. So to begin with, in terms of how legends develop, it's a bit like how do you make a snowman? You start with, with a, a snowball and then you roll it until eventually you get to a massive uh, snowball. And this is what I believe happened with, with the case of Muhammad. So we start in the seventh century, you can see the original historical person, quite small, um, not much of a biography. More details were added in the eighth century with uh, Ibn Ishaq and then later Ibn Hisham. And then more details were added through the various hadith and so on. And, and that the process hasn't stopped even in this century, the 21st century, there's new details being presented in terms of who Muhammad was, which is the idea of him being a human rights champion, which if you look at the early sources is preposterous. But so the idea I have is that there was a core historical person and then all of the legends and extra biographical details were added over time to that person to the point that you cannot recognize the original person from the later Muhammad that we, we see. And bear in mind that we are looking at Muhammad through the eyes of the ninth century, essentially. So if a real person led the Arabs in rebellion against the Persian and the Byzantines, I'm just, oops, let me just go back there, then there must be some trace of him in the record in order to identify. So let's see what we come up with. First of all, in northern Iraq, um, centuries ago there was a city called Edessa in a region called Osrohin Osro and uh, Pliny the Elder refers to the natives of this region and the kingdom of Kamajin as Arabs and the region as Arabia. That might be a surprise for a lot of you that so far north over 2000 years ago this is where people were referred to as Arabs. So this might help us kind of change our historical perspective a little bit. Now, between the two rivers on the map, Euphrates near the bottom and the Tigris at the top is the land which is of interest to us because this is where the Jews, according to Sabios, met Muhammad. And it's going to be crucial to figure out who the real person behind the title of Muhammad was. So in Sebius, in the 660s, he says the 12 peoples representing all the tribes of the Jews assembled at the city of Edessa. When they saw that the Persian troops had departed, leaving the city in peace, they closed the gates and fortified themselves. They refused entry to troops of the Roman lordship. Thus, Heraclius, emperor of the Byzantines, gave the order to besiege it. 
When the Jews realized that they could not mil militarily resist him, they promised to make peace. Opening the city gates, they went before him and Heraclius ordered that they should go and stay in their own place. So the question that's really important is where did they go? Where was their own place at that time? Was it Israel or was it Mesopotamia? For example, the Jewish exilarch resided in Babylon, so it could be that that's where they went. So those are our two options. So the Jews who who left Edessa, Heraclius told them to go to the home place. They either went to Jerusalem or somewhere around there, or they went to, towards Babylon. Sabios continues by saying, so they departed taking the road through the desert to Tashkistan, Arabia, to the sons of Ishmael. The Jews called the Arabs to the raid and familiarized them with the relationship they had to the books of the Old Testament. So the key question is, where was Tashkistan. Now, it was actually in this area which would suggest that where they were heading towards was Babylon. And we found this old map which indicates that this Tashkistan is between those two rivers of the Tigris and the Euphrates. So this is where they went. Um, just a little detail about the people who lived between those two rivers. Um, a resident of Mesopotamia. Can I just say something real quickly here. Yeah. If you go back to that map again, just so people are not too confused. Uh, go back mm -hmm. one slide. Can you notice Stesiphon is what is today Baghdad? Just so people know what we're talking about. Stesiphon is the archaic name. This is the Sassanian name for what we, a Persian name for what we now know today as Baghdad. So they can get their knowing. This is the same Baghdad that we are working with and that we all know about this and they've been in the news quite a bit lately. Yeah. So this is an interesting uh, detail here. It's, um, it's from a resident of Mesopotamia in the late sixth century. And this is what he says about the nomads in that area. There were many people between the Tigris and the Euphrates who lived in tents and were barbarians and warlike. Numerous were their superstitions and they were the most ignorant of all the people of the earth. Now, the land should be familiar to you because the land is actually just east of Raqqa, which was in the news a few years ago. Uh, Kalaniniakum, which I probably <laughs> didn't pronounce correctly, is the old name for Raqqa. Raqqa. And this is the, the area that we're talking about. It's in way up in northern Iraq. This is where the Jews went um, towards um, Babylon and where they will meet Muhammad, according to Sabios. Now, just south of Tachkistan was the Lakhmet capital of Hira. And this is also going to be important. Now, it says there, I'm not going to read it all. In that period, a certain one of them, a man of the sons of Ishmael named Muhammad, became prominent and near the bottom there he ordered them all to assemble together and to unite in faith so this was the person that they that they went to and they asked him to support them in in forming an alliance this is a key alliance between the jews and the arabs and this mahmed uh, was able to unite the tribes now before i go any further the thing that really struck me about the Islamic tradition is how could a crazy preacher manage to do that? It just, it is not credible that someone who had no background in leadership, he was um, unlearned apparently, couldn't read or write. Um, his only experience was uh, camel trading and going up and down the desert and he had no leadership skills whatsoever and he was an orphan according to the Islamic tradition. But it, here in the historical record, we see that this guy was a formidable leader. He was able to unite groups of people. He had lots of political acumen. Where did this come from? It doesn't drop out of, of the sky. He must have had past experience that would explain why he was able to do this. Because if you can imagine, he was dealing with a whole pile of different tribes, uh, Arabs of different religions and to try and bring those together was quite a, a difficult task to do. So this is the area that we're looking for Muhammad at that time. 
Now, in order to find him, we need to look at some of the early sources. We're looking for someone who hopefully was expelled from his city to fit in with the Islamic tradition of Muhammad leaving Mecca and who later returned in victory. So this is the sort of person we're looking for. In the fragments of the chart of Jacob of Edessa, 692, it refers to Muhammad, the first king of the Arabs, began to reign in the year 622. Another source, Anam 705, says Muhammad came upon the earth uh, in 622, 621. He reigned for seven years. And then the Zutkin Chronicle from 775 says their first king was a man from among them whose name was Muhammad. So from these three sources, what we're seeing is that this guy was a king, not just a merchant. So he had prominence. And this clashes very significantly from the Islamic tradition. Now, if he was a king, then the following has a different meaning to how it is commonly portrayed. In the fragments of the chart of Jacob of Dessa, it says, Muhammad goes down on commercial businesses to the lands of Palestine and of the Arabias and of Phoenicia, of the Syrians, of the, sorry, of the Tyrians. Now, this would suggest if he was a king, this wasn't just some small scale commercial business, but more large scale commercial business that maybe a king or a leader of country might do. Um, John Barr Pinkaye from 690 also refers to the fact that they had the death penalty for anyone who, who uh, broke Muhammad's laws. Now, if we take him as being a king, then this makes sense because that is something that kings sometimes did if you broke their laws. It doesn't necessarily mean that this was a fanatic and uh, 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 religious laws per se. Now, another key detail of the story, as we're trying to gather lots of different details to see if we can identify who the person was, Thomas the Presbyter offers us a really early um, reference to the leader who led the Arabs. This is from 640. He says that there was a battle between the Romans and the Arabs of Muhammad, but in the Syriac, it's actually the Tayyaye of Muhammad. Now, even if we delete the word Muhammad, the essential detail is that the person had to be the leader of the Tayyaye tribe. So a logical step to find out who he was is to find out who was the leader of the Tayyaye tribe at that time. It didn't occur to me until very recently to actually inquire who that person was, but that would be the logical thing to do. It, do we know in history who was the leader of the Taiyaye? If we do, then we know who the real person was that was later called Muhammad. A little bit of background, the Taiyaye or the Tai was a large ancient Arab tribe. And another uh, source, the Byzantine Arab Chronicle, 741-754, says that Muhammad was from nobility. He said he was born of a most noble tribe of that people. He was a very prudent man and a foreseer of future events. Now, I've, I've read this dozens of times before and it never occurred to me that where it says he was born of a most noble tribe, that would actually suggest that he was among the elite. He wasn't a commoner but someone of significance with a, you know, um, an important family line behind him. Very different again from the Islamic tradition. 618 is a key year. It was the year the Saracens rebelled, according to the Hispanic Chronicle. Other sources we saw say a king among them was selected four years later in 622. So 618 was the year the Saracens rebelled, 622 according to four, or according to different sources, say that this was when the king was selected. So there was four years of chaos with no uh, focused leader, but it appears to be that 622 was the time when the Jews met Muhammad and organized him to become the main um, protagonist and leader. Now, John Bar Pinkaye Pinke, uh, from 690 tells us the following, so the Lord, to punish the sons of Hagar for the ravages they had made, gave them two leaders from the beginning of their kingdom and divided them into two sections. So this would suggest to me that 
we need to find um, a situation where there were two joint leaders who formed an alliance and they jointly ruled everything. Now, uh, those in the West said superiority is due to us and the king must be chosen from among us. Those of the East contradicted them and claimed it was to them that this was due. When they had settled the business according to the methods of victory fell to the Westerners called the Umaids, a man among them named Mu Awaya took the reins of government of the two empires, Persian and Roman. So further down the road, we can see, according to Sebius, it was later uh, Mu Awaya that took over and was the outright leader of, of the, uh, the Arabs. But in the early days, there were two leaders, Muhammad being one of them. Again, we find in the Chronicle of Fred Fredegar, the seventh century, and we have a copy from 715. He says there were um, two commanders in charge. So who are we looking for? We're looking for ideally a Lachman king from 618 who became a rebel. Ideally someone who was kicked out of a city, for example, Hera, and who later reconquered the city. I don't know if you want to jump in there, Jay, at this point. No, I think this is good. Just keep going because I like where you're going with this. I'm taking notes and I'm going to come back with you some some questions. Okay. Keep going. I think you're on a roll. Uh, we're going now. We're moving into the Lachmet period. And I think most of us know about the Lachmet and the Gassanids. Yeah. Now, I, I'm just going to skip on to this one. So did Muhammad have, in addition to the title Muhammad, any nickname to help trace it? So I'm actually going into the Islamic tradition now. Um, to find another nickname for Muhammad, to see if we can make a link between the Lachmid king who I'm going to propose and Muhammad. So we, if we look into al-Bukhari, we have an interesting detail. There is a reference to a person called Ibn Abi Kafsha. Um, it doesn't say who he was, but it just, just he's actually only referred to in al-Bukhari twice in the entire uh, uh, volumes. But in the other occurrence, it actually says that it was the Prophet Muhammad. So Ibn Abi Kafsha, according to al-Bukhari, is the Prophet Muhammad. So we now have the title, Muhammad, and we also have Ibn Abi Kafsha, both referring to the same um, person. Now, Kafsha means sheep for sacrifice, and Abi Kafsha means father of the sheep. And to say um, Ibn Abi Kafsha means, it's kind of weird, it means son of the father of the sheep. Um, now, this is a strange uh, nickname to give Muhammad. Um, some have suggested that it's trying to mimic Jesus, who is the good shepherd, perhaps. Or maybe it's trying to suggest that his followers were sheep and very gullible. It's hard to know. But there's also another connection with the real historical person that connects um, him to this nickname. Now, I'm not going to read all of this, but um, in Al-Bukhari, he also refers to uh, the situation of Heraclius, who thought that the Jews were going to be the people to attack his empire because he had a dream where a circumcised people would attack his empire. But he later discovered it, that it was the Arabs a little bit too late. Now, the Arabs practice circumcision because they follow the religion of Abraham, which I have referred to in a video in my channel called Abrahamism. Sazimenes in the fifth century refers to the Arabs following what they believe is the original religion of Abraham, and they drifted into paganism. They've come into contact with Jews at a later point and became acquainted with the Mosaic law. This became, uh, uh, this became their practice. They also picked up Jewish beliefs later in their own fashion after coming into contact with Christians. So the key detail is why did the Arabs at the time of Heraclius do circumcision? It was because of this religion called Abrahamism, which is the precursor to Islam. So we don't need a prophet Muhammad to create a religion. I'm going to suggest that this religion was really 90% of the religion. And the Umayyads later made it their own and added their twists and shapes to, to make it into what we call Islam today. So who are we looking for? Our candidate is the Sassanian governor of Al-Hira from 602 to 617. 
who was an Arab. He was a co-governor of the city alongside the Persian noble Nakhirigan. Do you remember what I mentioned earlier on about the fact that in a number of sources it says that there were two leaders at the beginning? It, um, in 617, both of these were just deposed and replaced by a Zedba. Doesn't say why they were deposed, but he disappears from the history from then on. I haven't found anything about him after that. But interestingly, in light of what Thomas the Presbyter writes, um, it's going to be interesting when we see his name, considering he's, he's referred to as uh, the leader of the Tayaye tribe. Okay? Now, his name is Iyas ibn Kabisa al Tayi. So we can see two things there. We can see the close similarity between his name, Iyas ibn Kabisa, very close to Kapsha. Just a, uh, just a slight change on the name. And we can see from the patronomic, which is the last part of his name, that he was the leader of the Tayaye at that time. So this fits in with what we said from Sebios. He had become prominent and he was able to order them all to assemble together. Of course, he was able to order them to assemble together because he had been a king. He had authority among the people. Now, we find the following. A letter from Harvey's or Kusro, Kusro II, and said that um, after they had killed Newman, they had appointed an ignorant Arabian for the post. And they presumed that this guy, Eas, was going to be a harmless person that wasn't going to give them any trouble. We all. We Before also have, on, let me just back up yeah. real quickly, just uh, just to clarify, so we know what we're talking about. When you talk about the Al Taye, are you referring? Are you assuming that these are also the Lachmits, or give me the distinction between the Lachmits and the Taye? Are we one the okay. same, or are we talking no. different people? These were um, a tribe that hadn't geographical boundaries like the kingdoms of Lachmit and Gasnet. So, so those were. Bad. They were nomadic and they were spread across both of those kingdoms and further south into the north, north, northern part of Arabia. So they had huge power. They were, they were as you would say, very mobile and they were a threat to uh, the Persians because they went on raids into Persia from 602 onwards. Um, and so the Persians want someone to take control of these guys and stop them from raiding their country. So but they told there that the Muhammad is the name of the leader of the Taiye. Sorry, say that again. It's clear that you're saying that Muhammad would be that leader of the Taiye because his name yes. is Muhammad. Yes. Um, the early sources refer to the leader of the Taiye as Muhammad. But as we can see from the, the other sources, the, we, we have historical records that also say that Iyas ibn Kabisa is the leader of the Taye. So one is a nickname, one is official name. Yes. So the, there's a direct link there. If you look at if you look at the different sources of evidence that bring them together, it's pretty obvious that it's one and the same person. So in one case, they're referring to his let's call it his nom de guerre, his war name or his his title, and in the other case, we're seeing his official title, which is. Uh, Iyas Ibn Kabisa Which is backed up by Al-Buhari that you talked about earlier, who talked who refers to him as Ibn Al-Kabsha, which is very closely to Kabisa. It's almost one yeah. of the same word. So Ibn Al-Buhari is referring to something that he doesn't know about. That's the nickname that is actually referred in uh, amongst the Tayaye for the same man. Yeah, some, something must have passed down through the centuries and got to him. He, maybe he found the source. Like, he only mentions him twice, and he clearly doesn't know exactly why this nickname is there for Muhammad because his time has passed. And he probably didn't think it was significant, but he dropped it in any in any ways. But the problem for Muslims today is that little detail that he thought wasn't important um, has exposed quite a lot of the history because Fascinating. if it we could trace it, a man through his nickname right across 300 years. Yeah. Now, what's interesting, and I don't know if, if our, our audience are getting this, this means that the entire um, biography of Muhammad is completely bogus. 
there you go. Because, because what you have is you have um, a completely made up family tree with Muhammad, his, his father's name, his mother's name. We have details about him being an orphan and being raised by his grandfather and all of that detail is pure uh, nonsense. It's, there's no record of that. The real person never had to deal with poverty because he, he was given 30 villages along the Euphrates by Khosrow. So he was minted. So this guy had never um, experienced poverty in his life. He was not an orphan. He was some form of an outsider because he was a non lachmid king, of, if, if you know what I mean. And he, was, he wasn't a dynastic king. He was elected to be king by the Persians. Um, so there's an element of that in the Quran in the sense that they talk about Muhammad speaking with a foreign tongue. In other words, like that he's an outsider. That may or may not actually connect with him. It's, it's hard to know because I don't think the Quran has very much to, to do with Muhammad in reality. But I, what I like what you have done, though, is you have said when you look at the traditions, this doesn't make sense that a man with no no background, doesn't belong to any prominent family, has no position in society. How does he relate, ra raise so quickly to prominence? In this case, when you look at the historical record, and we're looking at the historical record, we're not going to the tradition anymore, we're looking and seeing what we do know from, on, uh, from that which exists in that century on the ground. When you look at the historical record, this man is a king. So already he has prominence. As Since he has prominence, it makes sense then how he can initiate laws and how there are laws that have to be obeyed. This then makes sense in, a con in the context right across the world. This is what you would think would happen. So actually the historical record is bringing to get us to a, better, a much more believable Muhammad than the traditional record. But the historical record places him hundreds of miles north, about six yeah. to 700 miles too far north, and places him... Over, over in the Euphrates area, not at all down in the Hejaz area of Arabia. He's not Arab um, at all. He's Iraqi. I would correct you, actually. I would actually put it at a thousand miles north, even further. Sorry. So, like, it's... <laughs> I'm still looking over there at Petra. You're right. I'm still looking at the yeah. material. So, you're saying yeah. a thousand miles. So, it's got the wrong yeah. man at the wrong place with the wrong name doing the wrong yeah. thing. And certainly, even the wrong prominence. Fascinating. Continue on. This is lovely. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would say about him is that uh, Sebios refers to the fact that he was knowledgeable of the, of the Mosaic law. Um, and this is so, solely because he was an Abrahamist. He, um, he belonged to that Arabic um, sect that goes back many hundreds of years. So this idea of him being a prophet is probably just merely because he was knowledgeable about Mosaic law and probably used it in his speeches with his people. And this somehow got blown up into all, out of all proportions, and he was suddenly turned into a so-called prophet. But there's no record of, of him actually ever, at that time, uh, being visited by an angel, uh, Jibril. Even the, like if we take the angel Jibril, that's a, a detail that comes from Manichaeanism, because the prophet Mani was visited by the exact same angel in Syria called Jibril. Um, so these little details, like in, if we take about another detail that uh, I want to point out is, where was Muhammad when he first had his revelation? He was in the cave of Hira. I'm suggesting that he was the king of Hira. You oh. see how the, the connections the same, and there they just confused the kingdom and made it into a cave. <laughs> exactly. So there's an echo of the the real historical details in the legend because. When you're dealing with people who are making legends, what, what they're doing essentially is they're just doing slight changes, making baby step changes, but if enough people keep passing it on and change it ever so slightly, yeah. you know, a few decades later, it's very significantly different from what it was originally. So I think that's what happened. So let's move on. So there's the Battle of Dikar. Um, it's said to have taken place between the Sassanid Persian army with Arab Lakhmid soldiers led by Iyas bin Abisa, so this is historical, and their opponents, the Arab tribesmen of Bakir ibn Wa'il. Modern scholars date it to between 604 and 611, it may be 609, okay? So, real historical record, Iyas was in that battle. Was Muhammad in that battle? According to the Islamic tradition, Muhammad was in that battle too. They could have shaken hands with each other if they were different people. 
According to the Islamic tradition, the Prophet Muhammad says, this is the first battle in which the Arabs took equitable vengeance on the Persians, and they achieved this victory through me. <laughs> right? The only thing that's wrong with all of this is Eas was on the losing side. So Eas was on the Persian side, but he lost that battle against his own people. This was probably a turning point for him because he essentially, he was working for the Persians against his own people. And uh, he probably realized which sides, um, how would we put it? He knew where the money was coming in the future if he went to the other side, if he fought with the Arabs rather than against them. But uh, that's also a key detail that Tabari puts Muhammad in the same battle as Eas. Now, um, if we think back, we said earlier on that there were um, two people working together. Um, in the Islamic tradition, Muhammad is seen to work with Salman the Persian. And even he's even referred to as part of Muhammad's um, household. And he was the one who uh, supposedly advised him to dig a trench to protect Medina. Eas was co-governor of Hira with a Persian too but his real name was Nikhiragan. So is he the origin of the Salman the Persian folklore? Salman the Persian occurs a lot in the tradition, the Islamic tradition. So I would suggest there is some historical core to that. And I think this is where it comes from, Nikhiragan. Now, um, a few more details here. Before Al Numan was appointed, Eas was also made an interim governor for a short while. It, I'm just going to quote a little bit from here. It was Eas bin Kabisa, who was nearly a quarter of a century later, appointed this time by Khosrow II, governor or ruler in Alhira, after the Lakhmid al numans deposition in 602. At some point, the Persian king awarded Eas 30 villages along the Euphrates as a grant for life and made him administrator of the district of Ayan al-Tamr. And, and there's also a note there that Eas was an interim governor in Alhira before the choice of Al Numan. So he got two bites of the cherry. He was made an interim governor uh, 25 years before 602, whatever year that would be, I haven't worked that out. And then again, he was made uh, the governor. You're talking about so 25 years before 602? Well, that would make it uh, 577. 577, yeah. <laughs> Sorry? According to the Islamic traditions, he was born in 570, so that would be impossible. He's only two years old. Yep. So there's obviously um, there's so many things wrong with the Islamic tradition in terms of the Islamic dates. Islamic tradition gets the wrong man at the wrong place at the wrong time, doing the wrong thing, and with the wrong date. Yeah. Now, <laughs> like, what I'm amazed by, I'm not an, ap an, I'm not an academic. I'm just an ordinary guy. I, um, I'm not a Muslim. And it's only taken me about six months to work this out. And you have how many million Muslims in the world, and none of them have managed to work this out themselves? Well, I, I think, find that incredible. I think I, what you're doing and what you're seeing here is when you look at anything that has historical, you need to go back to the historical context. And you need to go back to that which is actually from the same period. Every Muslim, when they hear what you're saying right now, they will immediately fall back onto the traditions. They'll fall back onto the ninth and tenth. And if you start from that premise, the ninth and tenth century are correct. If you start from the premise that Al Buhari that you've been quoting, Al Dabari that you've been quoting, are the are, are are the historical context. If that's where you start from, if that's your starting position, then all of this they would never look at. There would no be no reason to look at this because they already know the story. If, however, you say and you start from the premise like we do, that we don't trust those traditions because not only are they written too late, they're written too far away. And they made all kinds of other mistakes from what we're now seeing from the 7th century. Then we want to go back to the 7th century. Any, any good historian should do that. Start with the 7th century. Look and see what you're doing. And this is what you're doing right now in this exercise. And this is why it's so exciting, Mel, because you're actually going back to the writings of the 7th and 8th century. And you're going back to the people who were there who are observing it and you're going back to the names and the places where you can see on a map and you're actually positioning it on a map you're putting it in a timeline and you're also saying rather than trust the tradition let's see exactly what happened there this is called eyewitness account this is why when whenever there's been an accident what do police do they put out a sign and they want to know what eyewitnesses saw about that accident not what they've heard from other people or from third and fourth uh, testimony they want to know what they 
the eyewitness testimony is. In some ways, you're going to the eyewitness testimony. And you're saying, let's see what happened, on, what is going on on the ground. And that's why it's fascinating that even names like Hira or names like Kapsha are making their way into the tradition, but they've been deformed. And they've, uh, they're not only are the names a little bit deformed, they're also the wrong, the wrong context. Well, that you could expect to happen over 200 years of nothing more than oral tradition. Remember, everything that traditions are dependent on is oral tradition. So-and-so heard from so-and-so, who so heard from so-and-so. Oral tradition, by, by definition, can be embellished. And it looks like a lot of these were embellished. And that's why so much of what is finally written down by al-Buhari in 870, by al-Dabari in 923, the 9th and 10th century, much of it is mistaken. Much of it gets the wrong person. Much of it also gets the wrong context. But when you go back to the 7th century, you can see this is all, this is all political. This all is political. It's fascinating because it looks like we may now know why is it that Muhammad is the one that then is chosen. He is the one that's going to be chosen, as we're going to see in the 8th century and redacted back to another Muhammad from the 9th and 10th century from a place that didn't even exist, like Mecca. Anyways, back to you. We're, we're yeah, almost, yeah. we have about another seven or eight slides to go. This is exciting. Thanks a lot, Mel. Cheers. And obviously, um, just saying passing, it, we can see how this fits in with uh, Dan Gibson's work way up north again. It just confirms that this is where it all happened. Now, so Eas was awarded 30 villages along the Euphrates. He was anything but uh, an orphan, poor little orphan. Um, so we hear from Sebius again. So they departed taking the road through the desert to Tajikistan, Arabia, to the sons of Ishmael. In that period, a certain one of them, a man of the sons of Ishmael named Mahmed, uh, became prominent because the command had come from on high. He ordered them all to assemble together and to unite the faith. He was able to do that because Ayas was king. Now, there is a reason given here um, for why they chose him. Um, Al Numan's marriage, who was the, the Lakhmi king before Ayas, his marriage with two Tai wives, i.e., the Tayaye tribe, suggests that the tribe had links with the Lakhmids, but these were not strong enough to offset the need to keep up good relations with the Sassanids. And it was a man of Tai, Ias bin Kabisa, whom Kusro appointed after Al Numan's death as the first and last non Lakhmid governor in Al Hira. So they chose him because of the fact that he was able to lead the Tayayi and hopefully keep them in line and stop them going on incursions into Persia and raiding the, the caravans and, uh, and trying to get booty and so on. So that was the, the reasoning why they elected him. Um, I also found this. After Khusro had had al Numan killed, he appointed Iyas as governor over al Hira and the other former territories of al Numan. Abu Ubeda related when Kisra or Kusra, Kusra, I should say, had fled from Bahram, he passed by Iyas and the latter gave him a horse and slaughtered a camel for him. In this way, Kisra showed his gratitude. So Muhammad had been kind to Kusro and Kusro repaid him by making him brother. That's the essential detail. Um, now, another interesting detail is to do with Iyas's son. Can, can, now, can we just say one thing real quickly here? Can you give me the yeah. dates now we're talking about? What are the dates we're looking at for this Ilyas? Uh, Ilyas Ibn Kabisa? What are we talking about as far as... We're, we're talking from 602 to the 630s. There was, there was essentially two, two sections. He was an official Lakhmi king from 602 to 6... Uh, I think it's 16 or 617, I've forgotten. Um, so a period of about 14 years. And then what I believe happened was he became a rebel after he was deposed and joined the Arabs and led them. And this is what shows up in the other sources. And that's so at we're, 22. Or 6. So that's at 20. Yes, yeah, 622 is when he officially became, became a, if you like, uh, an appointed Arab leader, not just for the Lakhmids, but for all the Arabs. 622. So Which 622. Makes sense then why 622 is then chosen later on. Later on, it's then referred to as the Hijra. That's why yep. the, the, the date is chosen. Exactly. That's that's the connection. So obviously it was significant. This was the time when the Arabs were, were truly united and they had a strong leader and so on. 
Um, so I found this other little detail. You know, the Islamic tradition says that Muhammad had a son. Well, the real Muhammad, Iyas, did have a son. That's another contradiction of the tradition. His son was called Farwa. Now, Farwa was in Hira when General Khalid came to conquer it, and he organized the, um, the, a peace treaty with him and surrendered the city to him. So it shows that even though Iyaz had been um, deposed, he still held power through his son in Hira. Um, and Farwa has got an interesting meaning in Arabic. I haven't been able to get exactly the meaning, but according to Murad, it means something like sheepskin or wool or fur or something on those lines. Now, if you think back to Al Bukhari's nickname for Iyas, he was called Father of the Sheep. Now, if, if it turns out that Farwa actually means something to do with wool, then that nickname then is all the more relevant. So, Iyas really was a father of the sheep because his, his son's name was called Farwa, sheepskin. So, this is probably the origin of that nickname. Now, um, another interesting detail is Iyas and Muhammad are a bit like Clark Kent and Superman. <laughs> you, you never see them. You never see them in the same scene, but they always seem to be in the same general location. One disappears, the other one comes in. And this is true for Iyas and Muhammad. So according to what Hisham bin Muhammad has asserted, one year and eight months from the beginning of Iyas' tenure of power, the prophet was sent by God on his mission. So we see that strange um, correspondence in time between the two of them. And, and also, if you think back to that, the, the uh, I've forgotten the name of the battle where Iyas and Muhammad were supposedly both in that battle as well. The one against the Persians. The, the, yeah, the one between the Persians and the Arabs. Yeah. So here's a kind of a summary then of what I've been saying. So we have Muhammad was the first king of the Arabs, according to the fragments of the church of the Jacob of Dessa. His nickname was Ibn Abi Kapsha, according to Al Bukhari. The Taye of Muhammad, Thomas the Presbyter, um, fits in with uh, Ibn, sorry, Iyas Ibn Kabisa al Tayyi because he was the leader of the Taye. Um, he was from royal uh, stock, let's say, or maybe let's say um, noble, noble stock because according to the Byzantine Arab Chronicle, he was born of a most noble tribe. And the Saracens rebelled in 618, and this coincides with a year before he was de deposed. So this frees him up to be taking part in the rebellion. It might, it might be that he was the one that started the rebellion and uh, got, got them organized. Um, but that's essentially it. Um, I hope it all made sense, but there's a lot of details pointing from Muhammad to Iyas and vice versa, I would su suggest. Excellent stuff, and I think this is the kind of material that we're looking for. This is the kind of material that we need to unpack. This is the kind of material that we need to start discussing and debating, and also getting out in the public sphere, and that's exactly what you're doing here, and that's one reason why we're using this as a platform to make sure that other people start engaging with it. When you always look at history, it doesn't matter whether it's biblical history, it doesn't matter whether it's Hinduism or any other religious faction, whenever they make, whenever any religion makes historical claims, as they all do, because they all talk about an individual or a founder or somebody, uh, in the case of, of Christianity and Judaism, many of the prophets who are important to that tradition. The historical claims about Mount Abraham have had to been, have had to be scrutinized. And that's why you have people like Wellhausen back in the 1800s who did this and asking the question whether or not Abraham ever existed, whether there was someone who was called Moses who could have written at that earliest stage in 1400 BC. So these are normal for us as Christians. We're used to this. This is the kind of practice that we've been doing for goodness sakes for not, uh, going on to 200 years and we've been able to find responses to every one of those questions now we're asking the same question of islam and this is why it's important that we engage at this level with the founder of islam or at least as muslims claim the greatest the seal of all the prophets and of course the one who then is given the quran itself 
because of the claims they make about Muhammad, and say, remember, the traditions make an enormous amount of claims about Muhammad. They make the claim that he was born in Mecca uh, in 570. They make the claim that he moved uh, from Mecca to Medina in 622, that he started receiving the revelation while he was in Mecca in 610. And when he moved up to Medina in 622, then he took a number of people with him, about 80, maybe 200, and started a Khilafah in 624 there. And the Khilafah remained there from 624 all the way until 1924, when it was disbanded by Kemal Ataturk there in Turkey. But nonetheless, here are the claims that they're making. They're making these claims back in the seventh century, but they're writing them all down in the ninth and 10th century, redacting it back. And we're seeing lots of problems here. And you're bringing up some, a lot of these problems. You started out, and this is why it's very important. You start out by saying, we know nothing. And I loved your, I loved your snowballs that you have going down the hill, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Because when we start with the earliest inscriptions, take a look at those inscriptions. There's just nothing on any of those inscriptions about a man named Muhammad. And if these are Arab inscriptions from the same time period that Islam existed or began, you would think they would be replete with references to Muhammad, all kinds of reference to Muhammad, if he was a great leader, if he was a substantial uh, caliph, like the traditions tell us. And of course, the traditions say that by the time 624, 622, 624, he took over Medina. We have the Treaty of Medina, the Constitution of Medina that we're that we referred to. We've already dealt with that uh, already on uh, on this channel. But here, if you just if there's nothing at all from the historical record for such a great man, then you start to doubt whether or not his, that record is correct. What you're saying is from almost nothing, a very small snowball, then by the 8th century, we start to see quite a bit of him. By the time of the Malak introduces Islam as a religion and introduces it on the coins and introduces it on the Dome of the Rock and introduces, introduces it on the Caliph of Protocols, then you also see this religion start to form. And then you start to see the introduction to the manuscripts of the Quran that is gonna be the foundation for this religion. And where Muhammad comes into all that, well, that's up to an enormous amount of discussion. Mel, we've had this discussion as to when he, he, he actually was then created as an individual. And you put it to around 730, don't you? Yeah, I, I, uh, I think essentially, well, if, if we say first, the first thing I would like to say is I don't think he had any hand or part in the Quran at all because he was way too busy fighting these battles. I think this was something that was superimposed on him. Um, I think the, in the 730s, the, the nickname um, Muhammad got added to him, probably on, on, the, on the back of all the battles that he had won at that stage. But somewhere along the line, his original name was forgotten. And the, the new name, Muhammad, was uh, replaced. And he, because of that switch from his original name to the new name, I think there was... Um, a couple of generations of people who just simply um, didn't know who the original person was because they were they were looking for Muhammad when actually his real name was E.S. Um, okay. And you can well, imagine. Me, we just put something in here under your cap and then see if you can agree with this. Remember, when the Dome of the Rock, when you have reference to the La ilai ilaha Muhammadur Rasulullah, which is the Shahada that's known today, that's introduced on the protocols in 691. That's introduced on the Dome of the Rock. Uh, there in Jerusalem. That's also introduced on the coins from 692 and especially from 696. So Abdul Malik introduces that, but as we have already argued, and Murad did a great job of looking at those references and looking, and you did the same thing when you looked at that. That's not a person named Muhammad. It's the glorious one, or the, the, the uh, yeah. it's, it's an, an, a path that referring to the prophet of God. So it's not really a person that's referring to, is it? Yeah. So it, that's, that's where, uh, that title could be applied to any number of people. Any number of so, people or could not even be tied to anyone. But if that's where the introduction of the word Muhammad comes in, then yeah. you understand that why later, then that was then attributed to this, this great king, this, this uh, king, the Lachmit fellow, uh, that, uh, who is from Taiya, who is also known as, and his nickname is Ilyas ibn Kabasi al Tai. Now you said that faded out. Evidently it didn't fade out because you have also al Tabari referring to this same character, but, though he calls it uh, Abi Kapsha. Al Buhari, sorry. Ibn Abi Kapsha, the sheep. Yeah. So it, it's still, it, there's still a, 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 an echo of this in Kapsha. Yeah. 
like could be Kabisa, like you mentioned. So there, there is, I mean, these are little, little echoes that you see in the traditions that form back to what the, the, historic, the historical context is. But what I yeah. love to have done is by the time we get to the eighth century, then he becomes a person. And once he becomes a person, then of course, all the traditions need to introduce some kind of story about him. And what do you do with someone that's important to your identity, someone that's important to your, uh, your whole fabric of your religion, that you've got to put together. There's probably all kinds of competition going on as to what he was going to finally be. And it's not till the ninth century that you finally get to find out who this Muhammad is. But the Muhammad that we now see, that all the, they, that all the Muslims, 1.8 billion Muslims are dependent on, is only the Muhammad that finally made it onto the pages of Al-Buhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Daud, um, Ibn Hisham, and uh, Al-Tabari. These are the Sirah, the Hadith, and also the Tahbik. Those are the traditions that come in the 9th and 10th century. That's the <laughs> Muhammad that has now become the popular Muhammad of today. But what you're saying is, no, 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 this Muhammad is probably better known as Ilyas Ibn Kabisa Al-Dai. <laughs> his nickname was Muhammad. And take a look at that map that you see right in front of you. Look at the map that's up there. He comes from way up north, thousand miles further north, northeast. And he had nothing to do with Mecca. That now fits from what we're seeing, what Dr. Patricia Corona uh, wrote about in 1987 in her book, Mecca Trade and the Rise of Islam. She talked about it in the 1970s uh, called Hagarism. It's also what Dan Gibson has been finding out in all of his research on all the Qiblas. None of the Qiblas are facing Mecca until 727. All the other kibbles up until 706 are facing Petra, much, much further north. So it all is fitting to the same piece, the same place. Historically speaking, we've got the wrong man at the wrong place doing the wrong thing at the wrong time over here. And what you're telling us is, wait a minute, there is someone who is referred to as Muhammad, uh, who is actually very important because he was the one that started the rebelling against the Byzantines, and he was the one that was first with the Sassanids, and then he turned over and became, was rejected, and so he became an Arab, and then he became an Arab hero. And that's why in 622, 622 the year is very important. That could be the reason then why Abdul Malik then chooses 622 as the beginning of his calendar and why today we're still using 622 because the Arabs do create an identity for themselves, don't they? Do they not? And that Arab identity was probably started not at the time of, of the monarch. It was actually started much earlier, 622. And could it be this man, Muhammad, or should we call him Ilyas ibn al-Kabisa al-Qai? Could that be the man we're really referring to? One thing I would, would also suggest, when the storytellers got hold of his name, they had a choice. Are they going to tell um, a rags to riches story or are they going to tell the story of a rich man who became even richer? So obviously they chose the rags to riches, riches to richer story because that's a much more interesting story. So that's why he became an orphan. He started out with nothing and he, he, he met, he had a, a, he met Khadija, a, a rich widow and he, he came into great fortune and he just grew and grew and grew. So you have a nice trajectory upwards for him, which is a, makes a great story, but it's not true. There Sorry, you. Muslims. And then we have to finish with your last snowball, which is the 21st century Muhammad. And that snowball, he is now becoming, he is elevated to such a height, uh, just like they've done with the Quran. They have created a superhero out of him. He's become the Superman, whereas the Clark Kent that we're looking for, the Clark Kent is not quite as big as we, as, as the Superman. Two completely different people, and the one that he's become now in the 21st century, he is the greatest of all people. He's, there's nothing that's blem no blemish on his name, and every one of the biographies that are being made popular now, especially Karen Armstrong's one, uh, has taken out any of the blemishes. So what is he left? He's left with this archetype, this archetype hero uh, that is the best man in the best place for all people, all places at all times. No, he's yeah. not a man I want, not the historical man, <laughs> especially not the man that I see in the seventh century. And I'm no. so glad you're doing this work now. This is so good. This is excellent. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Jay, for having me. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Listen, we're going to put this up. Well, we're first finishing with the Quran. Once we get the Quranic stuff out of the way, this is going up next. This has got to go up next because not only are we taking on the book, we're also taking on the man. The book is going to be gone within, within, I hope, within my lifetime, so will the man. And now hopefully people will come back to the real book and the real man. And the real book, of course, is the Bible, and the real man is Jesus Christ. We know who he is. We know what he did. We know what he did 2,000 years ago. We know that he did die, and that's, his story also supports that. And that's why it's so good to know that he died and rose again for each one of you. God bless you. It's good to have you with us. 
Put your comments that below. You, we keep the comments open. We want to see what you think. We want to see what you say. Let's start this debate going, and let's see where we go from there. Okay, this is Jay and Mel. Over and out.